Hello, everyone, and good afternoon, and welcome to the sixth edition of Risk Hour here at FIAR, right after uh, uh, Romanian Broker Insurance uh, Insurance Day and after the uh, Private Pensions Day here at, uh, at FIAR. Uh, we have a broadcast dedicated to private pensions. We, we will focus about perspectives in, uh, in pensions in the CE region. And uh, there is no doubt that pensions are making the headlines since a couple of years now. All over Europe, there are big changes in the, in, in the public systems, which are showing a far less generous future of the public pensions. On the other hand, private pensions funds were seriously confronted with the crisis effects. They are recovering now. Many of them have already completely regained the losses from the previous years. But the question still remains if public systems will be significantly less generous and the private system is somehow vulnerable to the financial crisis, what should one do in order to be sure he will have a proper pension? Some solutions seem to be accepted by almost everybody, like the lifestyle, uh, lifestyle uh, funds. Others are strongly disputed as the idea of stronger guarantees in the private pension system. But building a mandatory pillar in all per, uh, pension systems seems to be another idea. All in all, the future uh, is open for, uh, for many possibilities. And our aim today is to take a look in the future and see what are the perspectives. And uh, our today guests are Mr. George Coates, independent journalist and pensions analyst. Hello, Mr. Coates. Hello. Together with uh, our colleague, uh, Mihai Bobocha, general secretary of the Romanian Pension Funds Association. It's good to be back at here. Welcome back, Mihai. So, Mr. Coates, uh, you have followed for, uh, for many years the development in the European pensions markets. How would you describe the present moment? Well, at the moment it's in crisis. I think you've, you've summed it up very well. On the one hand, um, I think the crisis acted as a catalyst. It brought home to governments that they must do something about the fact that the populations throughout Europe are ageing. And governments are made up of politicians. Politicians have a short term built into their DNA. So making decisions, unpopular decisions, that might show a good result in 20, 30 years is not necessarily going to be the top of their agenda. And some governments did start tackling this in the good years, the good return years, the prosperous years before the market downturn. Other governments didn't. They tended to want to put it off because no politician likes to take an unpopular decision to uh, the public. But, um, well, the crisis showed everybody that uh, they had to do something. So for those who'd done some work, uh, it showed them possibly they hadn't done enough. And for those who'd done nothing, it showed them, well, really they were remiss. And now they had to start from scratch in a very, very bad economic and political situation. Um, so, yes, it's been a wake-up call. Uh, why do they have to do it? They have to do it because um, pension systems were, uh, the government pension systems are based on the fact that people pay money when they're working. And when you have a young population, an expanding economy, the money's going into the state, those retiring are taking out some of it, but there are fewer people who are retired than are working. The demographic effect is that we're going to have more and more old people living for longer and fewer and fewer people paying those contributions. So that's the crisis. Governments must do something about it. What they do is, in fact, reduce the amount of money that people will get. Mihai, main trends? Um, I'd say that uh, George uh, managed to walk us through an impressive outlook of European uh, landscape today in the conference uh, about uh, private pensions. and. Uh, uh, seems like uh, there there are some major trends uh, evolving, which uh, I believe it's better to sum up a little bit towards the end. Uh, one of them, uh, which caught our attention because uh, uh, obviously we feel related to it, is that uh, uh, his homeland, for example, UK, uh, is setting up uh, personal accounts with uh, a little bit of soft compulsion there, or stronger compulsion. Uh, with uh, the auto-enrollment auto uh, system. And uh, if George could tell us a little bit about uh, the design of the system, that would be great, because uh, uh, we want to uh, benefit from his presence here. So um, do you think uh, 
compulsion is a trend, uh, such as your colleague from uh, Oracle uh, said today. I is it a trend or um, is it a solution to help people stay in, in uh, and uh, increase coverage and uh, uh, improve the prospects of a better pension? Uh, yes, I mean, it, uh, first of all, it should be a trend. Um, one doesn't like to be dictatorial and tell people what they should do, but the situation we're in is that going forward, people will be getting less money from the state. If they're getting less money from the state, um, they must make up that income, that post-retirement income from somewhere. And the somewhere uh, is that they buy a private pension. Um, there are different models, uh, private insurance options or occupational pensions organized by employers. And of course, there are many people that have these now. Um, the crisis, element here is that those countries that gave very large state pensions have not left enough room for occupational pensions. If I'm going to get a very large turnout from my pension, for example in Spain, an average worker who's done the right number of contribution years, which I think was 35, could get a pension of more than 30,000 euros a year. That's a huge amount. That's, that's a salary. I mean, that's a what's, very large amount of money. What's it compared to the last, uh, last wage, last salary? Uh, well, is it 80%? Uh, is it uh, no, I mean, some countries have, have uh, tied to a large salary, uh, to a large salary. In Spain, it was, it, was, it was that. It was whatever your salary was, you could get that. But it was, I mean, it, it's unsustainable. In the long term, it's unsustainable. So you must, that amount goes down. You must f have something to fill that gap. And if you're going to save, you must save for the long term. It means, in real terms, you've got to start saving when you're young. Now, who wants to do that? You've just got a job, you haven't got very much money, you've got a girlfriend, you want to buy a car, you don't want to say to a girl, let's go home by bus, but you know I've got a terrific pension. Um, it's not going to work. So the, uh, you, this is why, perhaps, compulsion is necessary. And I think if people are having um, an effective pension system, it must be mandatory and it must be simple um, so that everybody can understand it. It's not mysterious. Um, so yes, I think compulsion is necessary. Now, in Britain, we have uh, an attitude that says taxation is not a good idea, or a lot of taxation is a bad thing. Um, uh, when making a report some years ago that led up to the current reform, the, um, the author of the report, um, Adair Turner, uh, noted that although perhaps mandatory might be good, we can't do that in Britain, it would be seen as a tax, um, and presented, therefore, we'll do auto-enrolment, and that is people don't opt into the system, they have to opt out, and it's relying on a certain inertia. Your employer must, if they don't already offer you a pension, your employer must enroll you in, and to get out of it and not pay those contributions, you must um, opt out, and they're hoping that people will not do that. Um, of course, the danger is that they will. European governments seem to be determined uh, to give an impulse to, to private savings for pensions. How, uh, how do you think that they, they will be able to do that? It depends on the system. Um, some countries have, have already existing good systems that have suffered because of um, the recession in terms of uh, returns. It's, it's thrown pension funds themselves into turmoil because they must now rethink their asset management, things that were thought of as being very safe, like government bonds, turn out to be quite risky, especially if those governments were in were the Greek or the Irish. Um, but uh, elsewhere, it's very hard in continental European countries where they have uh, the system by and large, where the state has always been the main provider of pensions, to get people used to the idea that, no, they must um, look somewhere else. So, first of all, governments must uh, transmit that message. It's a very unpopular message for uh, governments to, to, to transmit. It's a great way of losing an election. Um, secondly, they must write the regulations and set up the laws that say these entities can expand, they can be there, they can grow, um, and they can exist to take up that slack. We saw something in Italy, for example, they've been doing pension reforms for some years, a little bit at a time, um, but they did set up occupational pension schemes, but they didn't communicate the, the need uh, for these. So the uh, participation rate is quite low, 
um, and the amount of money that these entities collect is relatively small. So they did try to get people into these some years ago, uh, 2007. Leading up to 2007, they again used um, uh, soft compulsion, um, silent assent, they called it, and in fact, people opted out of um, uh, one of the techniques they were using to flush th more money through the system. Uh, and yes, it's very sensitive. That's why I personally, I mean, my personal opinion is you need to communicate very, very boldly, very bravely the need to do this. You need to have the right kind of mechanism to do it, and you have to support it. While, while some governments work to uh, enact private pension systems or uh, develop uh, further their existing ones. There are governments such as uh, the ones in the eastern countries which stepped back on pension reform uh, in the last years, uh, looking apart from uh, the obvious uh, fiscal incentives to do that because obviously the budget also was in a crisis, the national budgets were in crisis and uh, uh, they needed more money, that's the easy way. What do you think was behind that? Uh, don't they believe in uh, pension reform or other than just being popular and trying not to lose an election by I, I, I don't, pensions. I, I don't necessarily think it was that. I mean, when, for some of the countries in Eastern Central Europe, making the reform was, was a relatively unpopular system in that it met various types of opposition. I mean, in Romania, the Social Democrats have never been 100% uh, sold on the idea. Um, in Estonia, there were uh, opponents of the system. Um, I think through, whenever these reforms have been pushed through, it's met with some opposition. And I think the, the governments that enacted them um, needed courage to do that. Um, yes, I think that the, the, they, they did it because there was a need to do it. So unpicking that uh, is a very retrograde step because it just means further down the line you're going to have people that are going to need pensions and the private sector will not have evolved, not have developed to be able to give them what they would have had and indeed what they should expect. Um, so it's a very retrograde step. Uh, if there's anything more behind it, I don't think so. I think it was just governments desperate to find money now to shore up um, a fiscal deficit, and there were these pools of money in the private pension administration companies, uh, and they just grabbed them one way or another, or they tried to. And indeed, it was seen in Western Europe too. Um, the Irish government took the pension reserve fund, that was a reserve, uh, that was a fund that had been contributed to out of the budget um, over the years to shore up the state pension system when it falls into deficit. Uh, it had 22 billion euros um, it had amassed, and the Irish government took 17 billion of that to, uh, to just back up unsustainable banks. Uh, you saw the same in France, where the French government some years ago had set up um, a pensions reserve fund, and those assets were seized and given to another entity um, that, uh, that is to um, look after the social security deficit. And so the, the existing pension reserve fund is still administering that, but they had to uh, change their asset allocation because instead of being there for the long haul, suddenly they might have to need that money shorter, so in, in shorter term. So uh, it was a big problem. So yes, it was a weakness. Government suddenly needed money. They looked around for anywhere where they could find it and that was there. Either due to political reasons or economical reasons, uh, we witnessed some strange uh, situation regarding or, or strange measures taken by the authorities <coughs> during the past years. Uh, and uh, I emphasize here the situation from Hungary, a uh, situation that uh, uh, we talked about uh, last year at, at FIAR. It was so close in Romania to happen, something it like that. It was too close yeah. for comfort. And uh, today in Croatia, maybe we can comment about uh, about uh, those kind of situations and measures taken by, by authorities. If you look at the last three years, um, throughout the 10 or 12 uh, CEE countries that uh, implemented such pension reforms uh, following the World Bank model in the last decade or so, starting from Hungary in 98, uh, you will see that Basically, none of these countries' uh, systems, private pension systems, escaped uh, unscathed from uh, the governments uh, looking up for, for cash everywhere. Uh, we see contributions that have been interrupted 
we see contributions that have been cut altogether or systems nationalized or whatever else uh, that might be called a reform in uh, vulgar terms, but uh, it was just uh, looting pension funds, so tapping into reserves that were put there for a reason and uh, basically uh, taking money out without uh, considering uh, alternative solutions and without considering, because we haven't seen even here any analysis of the effects. Uh, George was talking about a little bit earlier about how un un uh, unsustainable uh, public pension systems are on the long run, but I ask you how s sustainable are they right now because generosity has pushed uh, uh, all the countries in, uh, in Europe to, uh, uh, to the brink of a debt crisis. That, that won't happen in 20 years. We are in the middle of a sovereign debt crisis or we are very close to a sovereign debt crisis. It depends on how you look at it. And uh, this is a result, this is my personal opinion, that this is a result of irrational generosity out of uh, others people, other people's money that has taken place in, uh, throughout Europe uh, in the last uh, 20, 30 years. Correct me if I'm wrong. You know, uh, my favorite quote uh, of a famous uh, a politician, we, I don't quote politicians much, but this one I will, uh, I will uh, use, is that the problem with socialism and with su such things as extreme generosity in social policies, because I is that you eventually run out of other people's money. That sounds familiar, right? So um, that, uh, that was what happened in the last three years or so in the countries in the CEE region. It also uh, was very close in Romania. We, we still have a problem because we are behind the initial calendar of contributions for the second pillar. And uh, this adds up to a billion euros less in uh, assets by 2016. So it, it cuts 10, 15% out of the accumula uh, possible accumulation in the, last, in the first uh, eight to 10 years of the system, which is quite a lot because we are already starting very low and uh, very low wages, very low contributions. It, uh, at some point, uh, everybody will uh, start uh, noticing that 2%, uh, putting aside 2%, even though you do, if you do it uh, throughout your whole working life, that won't add up to very much, will it? 2% or, no, or it whatever, I mean, 3%. If... We talked about uh, inadequate contributions in DC uh, systems uh, this morning. Maybe you can elaborate on that. Yes, it, it, I mean, what, another trend in Europe uh, is that people are moving away from defined benefit systems, which is where um, the employee knows that when they leave, when they retire, they know how much money they're going to be getting. That's been defined in advance and their employer is responsible for making sure they have that money. Um, and that's being replaced by defined contribution systems which say, well, we're going to tell you how much you have to pay in. Uh, we're not going to tell you how much that's going to pay you when you retire. Um, now, looking at defined benefit systems, the employer typically will be putting in 15, 20, 25 percent of a salary notionally or in real terms into a fund, putting that aside knowing that every month or every year, I mean just, just that would be the amount of money that would be needed to deliver a sustainable pension. Um, defined contribution systems that do 2%, 3%, 5%, it, it comes nowhere near. Now the danger there is that people think I've got a pension. I'm getting, and people aren't necessarily going to go and do the mathematics. I have a pension. When I retire, I'll be fine. And then when they retire, uh, even without the interruptions that we've seen now, a uh, contribution rate of 2% um, over, uh, of perhaps a relatively small salary when they start work or because um, the economy in Eastern Central Europe is not so advanced, um, over a, a working lifetime, it still doesn't buy you a decent amount of pension. Um, so if I could just take up one of the points that Mihai made. Um, some of the governments didn't have to look to see if there were alternatives to seizing this money. They were presented with alternatives. In Lithuania, for example, the pension funds told the government, look, leave the system as it is, because otherwise you upset our mechanisms and so on and so on. But we will give you the money. We will buy government bonds. You will end up with the same net contribution but we will see it as an investment. It will be something we carry on our books as an asset, and, but you end up with the same amount of money. And the government didn't listen. They, they, they didn't even reject it. It was just not considered. Um, why? Well, 
it was a new government. They had um, uh, they had faced with a crisis. Somebody came up with a proposal. Okay, we tick that box. That's solved. Uh, now on to the next bit of the crisis without reopening that issue. Um, but the dangers are. I mean, if uh, having pensions or having a society where when people retire, especially if there are more of them because we are getting more and more old people who live longer. So having that element of society that have an adequate income when they retire is a strategic interest. It's a strategic interest before because, well, it's shameful for society to have um, old people who are poor. But also it's a strategic interest for the macroeconomy in the future. If you have old people, more and more old people, who don't have an, enough money, uh, they don't consume. They're not in the economy. They don't buy things. So that growing element of society is not contributing to the overall consumption effect, which is a main driver of GDP, of economic growth. Um, so it's a mistake. Then also, uh, old people vote. Young people don't, by and large. So you have an unhappy, increasing number of people who are easily um, motivated and mobilized, perhaps by populist politicians in the future, uh, who will say, this is disgraceful, we have to get some kind of pension for you. So it's, uh, it's socially disturbing, uh, it's economically disturbing, it's a strategic interest, and yet governments have thrown that strategic interest out the window for the sake of a short-term and, in fact, incomplete fix for their, economic, their current economic problems. It chances are that in the future, if you look at demographic prospects and considering that indeed older people vote more and uh, are less, uh, are more likely to look at such policies and to encourage such policies with their votes, I mean gener excessive generosity and things like that, uh, maybe uh, the thing, uh, things will get worse in the future because demographics show that uh, aging populations mean uh, a majority or, or a building up uh, of, uh, of older people that uh, tends to encourage this type of policies and maybe the chances of pension reform are uh, linearly going down. I would hate to suggest that in East European countries there might be unscrupulous populist politicians either now <laughs> or in the future. But, they are very um, elegant. But you no, know, it, it, it is an issue. It is, it is a problem because, again, another thing that they're destroying is a new industry, um, especially in Eastern Central Europe. Some years ago, you didn't have bright people in the global markets. You didn't have people who could manage assets. You didn't have the whole set of uh, companies that were around them, the, solicitors, the, the, the lawyers they needed, the uh, uh, asset managers, the uh, consultants. Um, you didn't have those connections to the international money markets. Um, and these people, they bring wealth. It's, it's a service industry. Um, yes, it's set, having a setback right now, but it's undeniable that the, um, the, the growth is, is, is huge, the growth potential is huge. So you're, you're destroying this new, or at least threatening, this new industry, which is something that, uh, that you need. The old metal bashing days are gone. You don't need to produce... Uh, um, uh, heavy metal objects for uh, Soviet, the Soviet economy. It's just not required anymore. What you really need is these new smart industries. And here was one that was beginning. And, uh, uh, well, it, it's, it's been threatened. Uh, let's move to Romania because you brought, uh, you brought it up. Uh, you talked to quite a lot of people today from our industry. And you uh, filled up uh, the last months or so uh, since your, your last update for Romania. So. How do you think uh, things were moving? Uh, I, I would uh, really appreciate an honest opinion from the outside because we're obviously biased on the inside and uh, looking at uh, different things perhaps. But you, you know quite well what happened in the last uh, three, four years since we started accumulating in pension funds and perhaps you can uh, summarize uh, the progress and uh, maybe you can even point out where we gone wrong and when, uh, wh what we can do to, improve, to further improve the system. Because if we look at... Uh, but we already discussed uh, the shift to DC and uh, compulsion and everything. Apparently, it's all there. So, in theory, we have a uh, close to state of the art, uh, I'm not being modest here, uh, design of system which is already in place and it's compulsory. It encourages, uh, so it, it encourages accumulation. It's uh, 
DC and uh, of course very low contribution. So what's, what's how's progress and what's left to be done and how do you see things? Well, I think in a way Romania was, was very lucky. It was lucky because it was unfortunate. It was unfortunate because the political structure uh, throughout the 1990s um, meant that somehow or other the pension reform wasn't enacted. It wasn't enacted because essentially the politicians uh, failed to get their act together. This meant that of those countries that uh, from Estonia to Bulgaria who enacted this type of pension reform uh, with Hungary in the vanguard, um, uh, Romania was the last. It was the, the last in the convoy. Now this gave it two advantages. One advantage was it could see what other people had done and perhaps um, learn from other people's mistakes. One saw that in Hungary uh, where they had uh, tailored their initial uh, design having seen what Slovakia subsequently did for, in, in one example. So Romania had the advantages of that. Whether they took full advantage of that I don't really know um, but at least they could see options and they could design a system based on existing practice. Um, the, the second part of being fortunate was that you started, the company started acting in 2008 when there was the market crash. So it meant they could tailor their asset allocation around um, those conditions rather than have the system designed for the, the boom conditions that uh, from say 2003, 2004 up to 2008 that, that other pension funds um, were servicing. So again, that has been um, quite good. I think they're, they're well, very good in fact, very fortunate. I think there are real problems. They, they, there are two sorts of risks to any venture like this. Market risk, markets go sour unexpectedly and in ways you don't expect. Um, then there's another major issue um, which I did speak to at, a, at, a, at um, an earlier uh, fire some, some years ago, and that's political risk. The, the problem with pension funds and pension systems is that they're designed by politicians. They're designed by politicians because this is the, the democratic uh, way of doing it. Unfortunately, uh, politicians' DNA is, is short-term. They, they think in terms of the next election. They want to do things that will come good the year before the next election. And as we said before, they don't really want to go necessarily and focus on something for the long term. Uh, so it's very hard for them to appreciate that a pension system is there for 40 years. Uh, somebody joins it when they leave school and join the workforce and they belong to it ideally until they retire 40 perhaps more years later now in that we're extending the working life. Um, and therefore the ups and downs of markets are not a problem over the long term. They smooth out huge rises, huge falls, smooth out over the longer period. But the trend should be up to get a return on income um, and to account for inflation and, and other issues. So uh, politicians don't seem to understand that. And it's not only politicians here. I mean, politicians in Western Europe too have to be educated by their pension systems again and again in the need to, uh, not only these, these knee-jerk reactions now with this economic downturn, but in terms of day-to-day -day asset allocation, where politicians, for political reasons, will decide to make regulations. Uh, and yet politicians don't understand markets. Of course, the last couple of years would su suggest that asset managers don't understand markets either, but certainly politicians don't. Um, an echo of that is, is here in uh, Romania, where it's very uh, easy for politicians to say we must have guaranteed returns in pension funds. And, well, you can't do that in the short term. Um, and, in fact, guarantees have to be paid for. There's no such thing as a free lunch, if I can use a cliche. And if you're going to have a guarantee, it means you don't plan your asset allocation for getting a return in the long term, you plan to, providing, uh, to, to provide that guarantee over whatever the period is that that guarantee will be calculated or, or triggered. So it means that you have to be very cautious in your asset management because you don't want to risk one of those delivery dates, which means in the longer term you lose the upside of markets. You won't take that element of calculated risk in case you upset this short-term 
guarantee requirement. And yet it sounds brilliant, doesn't it? If somebody says to uh, somebody with a, a, a member of a pension fund, would you like a guarantee on your pension? I'd love it, absolutely. And nobody says, but of course it's at this cost and that's the ramification and that'll be the probable result. Um, perhaps because in fact, indeed politicians don't understand that. In order to, to conclude one final question, uh, do you think that uh, C countries have some uh, specific issues regarding private pensions as compared to the systems and characteristics from the developed economies? Uh, yes, um, CE countries have done their pension reform. Uh, they've done a pension reform that is fragile because it's new, it's vulnerable because of political risk, um, uh, but it's been done and there is a system, a workable system, and after all the CE countries in so many ways started from a very, very low base. So they have a terrific growth potential, a huge consumer overhang, they have an enthusiasm that perhaps the more mature economies in Western Europe don't have. I mean, in, in American terms, uh, the CEE region is our uh, sun belt, this, this new area where dynamic young people with new ideas will come in and just overturn the economy. I'm, I'm a huge optimist on East and Central Europe and the potential that they have. So uh, if they can come through this, and if, they, if the man in the street, it's a question of, of education and also politicians, it's a question of education, can see the advantages of having a system in which, yes, you start with low contribution level, but as society um, uh, develops and as the economy develops, even a small contribution rate gets bigger because it's a, it's a percentage of a rising salary, plus then taking this, as, as uh, the economy grows, increasing that amount uh, by percentages every year, then there's a very good chance that people, that the system is sustainable, will be rescued and, uh, and will be there to do what it has to do. In West Europe, you know, these guys have got systems going back a hundred years. Stuff. That's turning an oil tanker. That's a real challenge. I uh, you know, gentlemen, I would conclude with uh, one final trend that I observed in our discussions today, meaning uh, that we talk more politics than pensions, unfortunately, which has been the case in the last years or so here. So uh, I, on this, uh, this uh, last remark, I would uh, like very much to thank uh, George, who uh, made his time to arrive here today and continue a year-long tradition to uh, follow FIAR and the Romanian private pension market and to thank the organizer for the great event today and wish you the best of luck for tomorrow and uh, the la remainder of the week with the, the other conferences. So you're doing a great job. Keep it up. Thank you and thank you for, uh, for being here with us today. Uh, we, we have come to, to an end and uh, Daniela Getsu and uh, Konstantin Rudnitsky We'll, uh, we'll wait for you in about uh, 20 minutes for a new show also dedicated to private pensions. Thank you. <laughs>